My name is Ann Zajac, and I'm a veterinary parasitologist at the Virginia, Maryland Regional College of Veterinary Medicine at Virginia Tech. But today, I'm here at Peckham Farm on the campus of the University of Rhode Island in Kingston, Rhode Island, with my colleague, Dr. Katherine Peterson. And we're going to present some material on fecal egg counts, using fecal egg counts, and how to do them in small ruminant parasite control. Support for this video was provided by a USDA SARE grant and by support from the College of the Environment and Life Sciences at the University of Rhode Island. So we'd like to present some material on using fecal egg counts in parasite management of small ruminants. And I want to talk a little bit about what a fecal egg count is, what are they good for, and what are they not good for, and then discuss a little bit about doing fecal egg counts and interpreting results. A fecal egg count principally tells you the number of eggs per gram of manure of barber pole worm and related worms. It's better than knowing only whether an animal is positive or negative because we have to assume that all animals are infected. Uh, these worms are very, very successful and it's very unlikely that an animal exposed to pasture doesn't have some level of worms. Why do we do them? And in my mind, there are two very important reasons to do fecal egg counts. One is to check and determine if the dewormers you're using are still effective. As you know, drug resistance in these important worms has become an extremely serious problem in small ruminants, and it's very helpful to know how effective the drugs you're using still are. Secondly, and again very importantly, the fecal egg count can help you make selection decisions uh, if you're going to try and use genetics to improve the overall resistance to parasites in your animals. And we certainly recommend that everyone try and improve genetically resistance to parasites. They can also be used with other information to design and evaluate your parasite control programs and use concepts of integrated parasite control. However, Fecal egg counts are not particularly good at telling you which animals have parasitic disease. So the primary point of them is not to identify specifically illness or disease in an animal. You can use them to, to make diagnoses, but you should always do that in conjunction with other information like clinical signs that are being shown by an animal. There are several tests that you can do, several different kinds of egg counting tests. We find that the most convenient and uh, most efficient way to measure the fecal egg count in animals, in um, small ruminants generally, in horses, and in young cattle, the best test is to use the modified McMaster's test or McMaster test. This is a type of flotation procedure. And all the common tests we use in veterinary medicine to check fecal material for parasites are based on the principle of flotation, where uh, a sample of feces is mixed with a solution that has a density that is greater than that of the parasite eggs. So parasite eggs float to the top where they can be collected and examined, but most of the debris in the fecal material will have a specific gravity that's lower than the solution, so it sinks to the bottom. So we're able to concentrate the eggs of the parasites for examination. With the McMaster test, it's still a flotation procedure, uh, but now we use a special slide with a grid and that makes the counting much easier. We still measure out the manure and the flotation fluid, 
uh, mix them together, but only a small portion of that mixture is counted. And the flotation process that we're relying on actually occurs in the slide itself. And we'll be demonstrating to you uh, the process of using this special slide. So once you've uh, put your sample in the slide, you count the eggs, and then can calculate back to yield that number of eggs per gram of manure. So you might ask, wouldn't it just be more accurate to count all the eggs in the sample? And that way we'll know exactly how many there are. We're not just taking a small amount and uh, counting what's in a small amount. The difficulty is that with sheep and goats, there may be many thousands of eggs in a gram. And that process of counting all those eggs is tedious and extremely time consuming. So what we have here is a system where we're only counting what's in a small amount and then calculating back to give us the final amount. Now that means that we can miss very small numbers of eggs in a sample. But in sheep and goats, that doesn't matter. Very small numbers of eggs are not important. And so it's better to sacrifice uh, the ability to find an animal with only a few eggs per gram and not have to spend uh, an hour counting a sample that might have thousands of eggs per gram. Now what do we want to count with these fecal egg counts? Well they were really designed, that process was designed principally to count the eggs of worms we call trichostrongyles or strongyles uh, that's the principal purpose for this egg counting procedure. That includes the barber pole worm, Hamacus contortus, uh, but also some related worms because there's a number of worms related to Hamacus and they all produce identical eggs. So if you've ever sent a fecal uh, sample to a diagnostic lab to get a fecal egg count, you may have gotten back uh, uh, results uh, that just refer to trichostrongyle or strongyle eggs, and that is this group of parasites, including barber pole worm, that all produce eggs that are similar in appearance, and I'll be talking a bit later about identifying these eggs and the characteristics of those eggs. Now this group that we're talking about, uh, the principal parasites within it would be barber pole worm, which is the primary worm parasite certainly east of the Rockies that most people face uh, problems with. This is a parasite that tends to be dominant in the summer grazing season and will spend the winter time as a rested larvae. This trichostrongyle or strongyle group also includes some other uh, important uh, worms, Ostertagia, also called Telodorsagia, the brown stomach worm, that you might see more often in the winter time or late fall, and then also Trichostrongulus, which is a very common worm. But Homonchus is our primary worm that we deal with in the summer grazing season, is the parasite of greatest concern. When you do the McMaster's test, that flotation will also float other parasites, including Coccidia, and tapeworm eggs, and whipworm eggs, and threadworm eggs, and we'll talk a little bit later about what, uh, what those eggs look like as well, so you'll be able to recognize them when you see them. But it's also important to, to recognize, too, that with tapeworm and whipworm and threadworm especially, it's very unusual to see clinical problems with those animals. We're not spending much time evaluating uh, or worrying about numbers that you would see of those worms. Uh, coccidia are a little different, um, uh, a little harder to interpret, but uh, in animals with diarrhea often uh, people will count coccidia as well. And basically you have to assume that all small ruminants are exposed to these parasites. And so when you look at the results of fecal egg counts, again, you, if you've submitted samples to a diagnostic lab, you might receive uh, uh, results like these, uh, where you have all these categories of parasites mentioned. You'll see egg counts for all of them. Uh, and you'll also see that some animals are recorded as, uh, as NS, which means none seen. But 
you need to appreciate that if one animal is exposed to whipworms and has whipworm eggs in their manure, they're basically all exposed. This isn't so much a situation where we're seeing infections in some animals uh, and not others. More likely, you're seeing uh, just uh, eggs coming out in some animals uh, and not others. So these other groups, the tapeworms, the whipworms, the threadworms especially, interpretation of egg counts really is not very useful. So there is a strong feeling, a strong desire to use fecal egg counts as a, a way to evaluate who is sick, who, is, uh, who has parasitic disease. But that was never intended uh, to be the, the purpose of fecal egg counts. And I can give you an example with these egg counts right here. You can see that, for example, we have an animal with 1,500 strongylid eggs per gram, but the an animal may, uh, may be just as healthy as the, one, uh, uh, as the one with 150 eggs per gram. Similarly, we have one with 3,000 eggs per gram, and we can't say anything about the clinical condition of that animal uh, based on the egg count without additional information. If you look at the, the uh, column with the coccidia in it, you may say 10,000 coccidia per gram, that animal needs to receive anti-coccidial treatment. No, not necessarily. If that animal is clinically normal, uh, there's no indication for treatment. So don't overinterpret the numbers in terms of the clinical condition of the animals. Occasionally, you'll have animals with super, super high numbers, amazingly high numbers. And yes, even I would say 50,000 per gram is, is probably a little high, but I have seen lambs with coccidia counts of 50,000 per gram, and their little pellets were so hard I, I could hardly break them up to do the fecal egg count. So it's really, we really want to take the clinical condition of the animal into consideration. And uh, we're hoping that uh, many, if not all of you, are also using the FAMACHA system uh, to evaluate uh, anemia and make deworming decisions and selection decisions. And I can show you even here that while fecal egg counts usually run pretty close in parallel with FAMACHA scores, they don't always. So here we have that same group of uh, fecal egg counts along with the FAMACHA score, and you can see the animal with the highest score indicating the lowest number of red cells is not the animal with the highest fecal egg count. They usually run together, but not always. So in evaluating your animals uh, for making breeding selections, you want to look at both. FAMACHA scores measure uh, what we call resilience, the ability of animals to tolerate infection. Fecal egg counts are more likely to give you information on resistance. So you always interpret uh, your fecal egg counts uh, with, uh, in conjunction with clinical signs. Are there signs of disease? You also have to consider treatment, uh, treatment history. If an animal's just been treated, its fecal egg count would, we hope, go down. And also you need to consider the time of year because the number of eggs in fecal samples will, will vary seasonally. And it's important to know the patterns of infection in your own region. Uh, where we get worm populations, adult worm populations falling in the winter months because worms tend to go into uh, developmental arrest, fecal egg counts can drop dramatically. And you would not expect to see, uh, you would not expect to be able to predict the actual number of worms in an animal by doing a fecal egg count in the middle of winter. So with all that said, why do we do fecal egg counts? Well, firstly, to see if drugs still work. That, that is a primary use for fecal egg counts. And we can do what we call a fecal egg count reduction test in sheep and goats, where we're just comparing animals before and after treatment. Uh, we'll take the same animals each time. We we'll take fecal samples, 
deworm them with the drug of choice at the correct dose, and then 10 to 14 days later, take a second fecal sample and do some math and determine the percentage decrease in the fecal egg counts. It's very important to do that second sample in a 10-day to two-week period. Uh, and we have provided on the URI parasite uh, control in small ruminants webpage, we have uh, additional information on doing uh, uh, fecal egg count reduction tests in terms of the numbers of animals you need, the, uh, the num minimum number of eggs per gram, starting in the animals and doing the math. So that information is available to you on the website. In general, we're looking for drugs to produce a 90 to 95 percent decrease in the fecal egg count. And as our uh, problems with resistance, uh, drug resistance grow, we're seeing more and more farms where the fecal egg counts do not uh, achieve um, that level of reduction following drug treatment. Um, you always have to interpret these uh, uh, results, um, taking into consideration uh, if, whether or not the animals received the right dose and were enough animals used and were egg counts sufficiently high to start with. But this can be a powerful tool in evaluating whether or not your dewormers are still working. The second uh, very important um, use for uh, fecal egg counts in our mind is to help you make decisions in selective breeding programs. So we recognize now that under normal conditions, most animals are really able to control their parasites uh, unless they're overwhelmed by parasite numbers or, uh, or are vulnerable, particularly vulnerable because of other circumstances. Uh, but generally, most animals are able to control their parasites through the development of a normal immune response. There are a few animals that are highly, highly susceptible. And that susceptibility is to a large degree determined by their genetic makeup. And we know that most of that susceptibility is inherited because it's related to the immune response. And if we take a population of animals, we can see that 30% of the animals carry 80% of the worms. And what I'm showing you here in this graph is uh, fecal egg counts from my own sheep. So these are just individual fecal samples collected from my sheep. The number of eggs, eggs per gram have been determined. And then I've just put the, uh, the individual results on the gram, the the graph kind of ranking them from high to low. And you can see when I block off that line uh, representing the 30%, the that top 30%, you can see that they are contributing a huge number of eggs um, to the pasture contamination for all the animals. That's my 30%. Uh, the remainder of the animals uh, have much lower fecal egg counts. So, we, can, we, we know what to do with that top 30%. We would say, don't breed them. Much of their susceptibility is genetically based. Don't breed them. Keep them out of your breeding program. The problem is, we also want to be able to identify the most resistant animals. It's pretty easy to identify the most susceptible 30% using the FAMAGE system, because there you're directly assessing anemia, uh, you're able to recognize clinically which animals are most uh, affected, and you know not to, not to keep those in your breeding program. The difficulty is, as I said, most animals can control their parasites. So when you look at the other end, who to select for breeding, who really to, to choose to keep, that becomes a slightly more difficult job, certainly a more difficult job based on FAMICA, and now here is where fecal egg counts can be really helpful in determining the, the animals with the higher levels of resistance. So what I've given you here is an example, we'll say of lambs in the summer grazing season 
where you want to try and identify the most resistant animals. It's probably uh, a good idea to test the animals twice. You can get uh, some variation. You're going to get some variation in their fecal egg counts. So take two fecal egg counts um, from this group of lambs uh, that we want to select from. You also want to do these fecal egg counts when you know the fecal egg counts are going to be pretty high. Uh, low numbers, our McMaster test becomes less accurate at low egg counts. So seeing differences between animals when the egg counts are not high is going to be very, very difficult. So we want, we want two samples at least. You can certainly do more than that. The, the greater the number you do, the more information you're gathering. But do at least fecal egg counts during those months of the year when you expect the egg counts to be highest. Now it may not be able, you may not be able to absolutely pinpoint the most resistant animal, but you're certainly going to be able to narrow things down substantially. So looking at these numbers, we have that first animal um, that has a very low fecal egg count in June, and in July it was so low we didn't even see any eggs. That's a pretty good indication that this is one of your more resistant animals. That next animal down, uh, had 3,000 eggs in June, 6,000 in July, I would take that to, to indicate that it is a more susceptible animal compared to other animals being uh, shown on this graph. And, and you can uh, see a couple others in the table um, where I've indicated, yep, I would suggest that these are more resistant or more susceptible. There's a big group of them right in the middle um, that I can see no difference at all in those animals. Yes, the absolute numbers are different. They're higher, they're lower. But those differences are not great enough to allow me to really draw a conclusion about the animals and, and recognize that most animals are going to fall in a, in a middle group there that are, are not extremely high, but it's going to be hard to tease out uh, anything from that information. So we're looking for big differences here, not small differences. If the maximum egg count is 1,000, you're probably not going to be able to, to, to really differentiate very, very closely among a group of animals. We feel that individual fecal samples offer you uh, the best uh, opportunity to get the most information from your herd or flock. But in some circumstances, uh, owners may want to do a composite fecal sample where the feces of several animals are combined and then a, a fecal egg count is done on the combined sample. The difficulty is that you lose uh, the ability to recognize which animals are most susceptible and it becomes harder to really evaluate drug efficacy just using a single sample. However, in some circumstances, this may provide information that's useful to owners. In a composite fecal sample, feces from a number of animal is, animals are collected, and then you need to use the same amount of feces from each animal. So you'll need to weigh out uh, the same amount of feces uh, and then make a larger sample. Um, I also would recommend strongly that you divide your animals up into groups so that if you're doing a composite sample, you do one for young animals versus adult animals since we know that young animals are going to have higher fecal egg counts uh, across the board. Finally, uh, fecal egg counts are great for using in conjunction with other information to design and evaluate integrated parasite control programs and already mentioned combining uh, fecal egg counts and FAMACHA scores to make treatment and selection decisions. The more information you have, the more, uh, the more specific and accurate your decisions become. We have here the supplies you're going to need to collect uh, fecal samples. 
And you'll see what we have is uh, gloves, exam gloves. We also have uh, labels. You can write directly on the glove, but if you prefer, you can write uh, the animal's identification on the label, and then when you've collected your sample, uh, you can essentially fasten off the glove by putting the label around the, the glove and sticking it to itself. The other thing that you're going to need, really, is something to lubricate your glove with if you're collecting a rectal fecal sample. Something just to make your fingers a little more slippery uh, because you're going to be passing them uh, into the rectum a short distance. Now this lubricant can be a commercial lubricant that you'd buy uh, at the feed store or uh, again at the drug store. It could be something like Vaseline. You can even just use water. Once you've collected the fecal sample, if you're not going to be able to examine them right away, put them in the refrigerator. And fecal samples can be uh, refrigerated uh, for a good week without really causing any loss in the number of eggs in the sample. Don't freeze them, just refrigerate them. Uh, if you're going to be sampling a large number of animals and you're not going to be able to do anything with the samples right away, it's a good idea to have a cooler sitting right there with an ice pack in it. We don't really want to put the samples in direct contact with freezer packs. And this is because if you are interested in taking some of those fecal samples and having some identification done on, uh, to determine exactly what uh, types of worms are present, uh, if they come into contact with that frozen uh, ice pack and then the eggs freeze, it will prevent uh, development of the eggs. We've shown you the supplies that you need to collect a, a fecal sample and now we want to demonstrate for you how to collect a rectal fecal sample. Uh, first of all, you need an exam glove, and I've put one on my hand. Uh, I'd suggest taking off rings just because sometimes they tear the exam gloves and uh, add an additional uh, layer of uh, material to your hand. With the animal restrained, I'm going to put some of the lube on, on uh, a couple of my fingers. Just to make them a bit slipperier. And then uh, lifting the tail, you can see the anus, and you just slip those two fingers in a nice big sheep like this. It's easy to slip two fingers into the anus, uh, and you meet a little bit of resistance, but not very much. Now, once you've inserted your fingers, and they don't have to go very deep, just spread them slightly and let some air in, and that will often signal to the sheep or goat that the rectum is full and it stimulates them to defecate and very often they'll defecate right into your hand and then there's no need to push and, and push your fingers in as far as they'll go and you can see here this sheep has cooperated and pushed into my hand plenty of feces uh, to do a fecal egg count. So then all we do is pull the glove up uh, over the fecal sample and you have a nice container for your fecal sample. You can either tie it off at this point and then label the glove with a, a sharpie or other indelible uh, ink pen. What I like to do is take a simple address label and write the animal's identification number on it and then use that as the closure for the glove. So you can, we'll use a, our little table here, thank you. Uh, you can just use it to make a fastening for the glove to keep it closed. These labels are great, but they won't stick to the material of the gloves. You have to stick them uh, to themselves in order to get them to stay stuck. So here we have a fecal sample uh, identified and ready to be analyzed. We have displayed here all the supplies that you'll need to do your fecal egg counts. When you have uh, uh, your sample, 
The first thing you'll need to do is weigh out your fecal sample, so you, you'll need some sort of balance in order to, to weigh out the sample. Uh, we have a standard laboratory balance shown here, but you can also use a kitchen balance, a balance you find on uh, online, as long as it measures in one-tenth gram uh, increments or 0.1 gram increments. That's the level of sensitivity you need in your balance, and you can find a number of them now that are, are not very expensive but give you that level of sensitivity. You're going to need for each test two cups, and these cups can be plastic, they can be paper, uh, they don't have to be very large volume cups, uh, but those are the cups you're going to use to mix your fecal flotation solution and fecal sample together. So having uh, weighed out your fecal sample into a cup, you're going to add the flotation solution, and in order to measure out the amount of flotation solution you need, you can use a laboratory graduated cylinder, you can get a 30 to 60 ml syringe to do it. Uh, you can get a small measuring cup that also has uh, volumes identified in milliliters. And then you're going to measure out your flotation solution. There are a couple of different ways to get flotation solution. This uh, container has fecosol in it, which is a commercial solution. You can easily buy. Many veterinarians use it for their fecal exams. So there are commercially available flotation solutions. You can also make your own flotation solution using uh, sodium chloride salt or magnesium sulfate, which is Epsom salts. And basically what you're doing with one of these salt solutions, the salt or Epsom salts, you're making a saturated solution. So you're adding one of those salts to water, mixing it up, letting it equilibrate, and uh, adding enough so that not everything goes into solution. We're trying to keep some of the salt from going into solution so that we know it's a saturated solution. And if you look at this beaker, you can see at the bottom of the beaker there's some of the undissolved salt, meaning that it's a saturated solution. We have a fact sheet that accompanies this video that gives basically the amounts of salt roughly that you would need in order to achieve a saturated solution. The amount that saturates the water is affected by temperature, so your final test is to always make sure you can see a few crystals at the bottom of the container to know that that solution is fully saturated. You can also use a commercial uh, sugar solution or sugar solution you make up yourself. I don't like using sugar solution particularly for fecal egg counts because it is so sticky and viscous that you have to do a lot more cleanup in my mind. Uh, in order to just keep things clean. So I always uh, prefer a salt solution uh, in doing fecal egg counts. So having measured out your flotation solution, adding it to the cup that has your fecal sample, then you want to make sure it's really well mixed up. And we use tongue depressors uh, that uh, for this purpose you can also buy these as craft sticks uh, in craft stores and we mix thoroughly uh, and I'm going to talk in the demonstration of the technique about what it takes to mix thoroughly. But you want to mix it thoroughly, and then we're going to strain that mixture into another cup to try and get out some of the big lumps. And to do the straining, you can either use uh, a sieve, a food sieve, a tea strainer, uh, and pour that mixture through, or an alternative would be to buy um, cheesecloth and make cheesecloth squares that you pour through. And the kind of cheesecloth that you buy uh, for cooking would be appropriate for this use. I think for most people, probably the tea strainer idea is going to work better. You would just rinse it out in between animals to get out the, uh, the material that's left. Having strained it through a strainer of some sort into a cup, the next thing you want to do is fill your slide. Here's your McMaster slide. 
McMaster slides for performing the fecal egg counting procedure are available from several, several sources, but there's one supplier in the U.S. that uh, supplies most people with their uh, McMaster slides, and we've provided the address here and, and other contact information. Uh, Calix Corporation offers two types of McMaster slides um, of the two-chamber variety, and you want the two-chamber McMaster slides. They come with a green grid or a kind of clear etched grid, and we always find the green grid ones are easier to count. Uh, we'd recommend that you get them. They're not very expensive, and you'll find that they last for many, 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 many fecal counts. You just rinse them out after each use, and then you can reuse them for an extended period. But you have to take some of your mixture and fill the two chambers of the McMaster slide, which we'll be showing you how to do. And uh, to do that, you can fill the McMaster slide with a pipette like this, which is a standard laboratory transfer pipette. You could use a 1 cc, 1 ml syringe uh, to fill it, or you can just go and get some standard eyedroppers like you buy at the drugstore, and they'll work just fine to fill the chambers of the McMaster slide as well. So now you have the, you've, you've created the slide that you want to read, and now we go to the microscope, which is uh, uh, the most, uh, requires the most investment of all the materials that you're going to use. And I think there's a few things that are really critical in the microscope that you get to perform the McMaster's test. Uh, microscopes come uh, with either one eyepiece or two. Uh, two is more comfortable, but is not critical, and so if you get a monocular scope instead of a binocular scope, that's fine. Uh, the objectives, you, uh, lenses that you need, most microscopes will come with several objective lenses. You need one that has at least a 4x lens and a 10x lens. Uh, the higher magnification lenses are not required for doing fecal egg counts. You also, uh, it's very desirable to have a movable stage. So the stage is where we're putting our slide to look at it. And you can get microscopes that have this set of controls here that allow you to mechanically move the stage. This has a mechanical stage. That is much, much, much more convenient than microscopes that don't have a movable mechanical stage. In that case, uh, if you don't have the mechanical stage, you have to put the slide on the stage and then with your hand move, uh, move the slide so that you can count under the grids. And that takes very fine movements. Uh, it's, it's, it, I find it frustrating to do with just uh, a non-moving stage. So if at all possible, I would highly recommend a mechanical stage. You need an internal light source. Uh, so a light that's coming up from the bottom to project through the, uh, uh, through the, the slide. Uh, I know there are a number of uh, perhaps older scopes out there, very inexpensive ones that don't have an internal light source. Uh, your life will be much easier if you get one that has the internal light source because you need to cast a fair amount of light on the slide to be able to see the eggs and count them. For those of you who are unfamiliar with use of the microscope or have used one but it was a long time ago and you've forgotten, we also have another section on this video where I'll describe in greater detail uh, the use of the microscope. Well, now you have your fecal sample and all the supplies that you need to perform the McMaster test. So I'm going to demonstrate now the steps of the test. I'd like to say at the outset, I'm going to show you the way I do them. If you check around the internet, you talk to other parasitologists, uh, you may find some slight variations in what they do. 
And that's perfectly okay. There's no uh, particularly right or wrong way to do them. The critical thing for you is to always do it in exactly the same way. Because whatever variation of the McMaster test you use, you'll only be able to compare your results from animal to animal or time to time if you've done the test consistently. So this is my variation. Other people might be slightly different, but it really doesn't matter. Just be consistent in what you do. You have your fecal sample in a glove. And I want to uh, suggest that you first start out by doing as much as you can to make sure the, the sample's well mixed. And I like to uh, just squeeze the feces around, which is also good for stress relief. And uh, uh, we'll get the eggs distributed more evenly in the manure. The eggs are not evenly distributed throughout the animal's manure, and you want to get as consistent a sample as you can. This is particularly important if you've used a composite sample, if you've taken feces from several animals and mixed them together. It's absolutely critical that you mix it well. Also, this sample I have here is nice and soft, but if you had solid pellets, solid individual pellets, it's easy if you, easier if you can kind of break them up a little bit in the glove first before you start measuring them out. So I suggest you do a little massage here before you actually measure out your sample. So we have our scale on, and we need to get two grams of fecal material. Now most scales, all scales virtually now, the digital scales will allow you to tear the scale, meaning that when you press the button that says uh, zero or tear, you'll be able to go back to zero with your cup. On the, on the scale. And then, uh, if, you've been, if you've got the kind of nice soft feces I have, I can just squeeze some of it down into the fingers of the glove, cut off the, uh, cut off the tip of the finger, and then kind of squeeze it out. If, if it's pelleted still, you'll have to make a bigger hole in the glove and get it out that way. And we want two grams. Oh, and I probably won't be able to get it much closer than this. I have 1.9, 2.1, and that's close enough, and that's perfectly fine. If you get 1.9 or 2.1, you don't need to worry about getting out that one-tenth of a gram. And you can see what a small quantity this is of manure. It is not a large quantity at all. So when you're collecting fecal samples from your animals, you don't need to get a huge amount of manure from each animal. So we've got our two gram sample. Now we're going to add the flotation solution. And I'm just going to use a syringe here to draw up 28 mLs of flotation solution. Drew up some air there, which I don't want. And then we're going to just add the 28 mLs to the fecal sample. <laughs> now normally when I'm doing uh, McMaster tests like this, I'm doing a lot of them. And so what we would routinely be doing is setting up cups. So we have our, our fecal sample, we add the flotation solution, then we go on to the next one, and we set up another cup with fecal sample and flotation solution. And what you accomplish by doing it in this, in this way is that you're allowing the feces to sit in the flotation solution and soften up a bit. Because frequently, especially when you're working with pellets, they're pretty hard, and it's very difficult to, to break them up by mixing, just by mixing with your tongue blade. So it's preferable, it's certainly preferable to let the sample just sit here for five to ten minutes, let it soak up some of the uh, moisture from that flotation solution, and then when you come back and start stirring, it will be much easier to break up the sample and get a nice, even, homogeneous mixture of flotation solution and fecal material. 
And I think that you can appreciate that here I just have kind of a uni pretty uniformly brown mixture. Uh, you can see little, uh, little pieces of debris in there, but it's, it's pretty well mixed at this point. So now I want to strain it. And straining it has the advantage that by removing any big bits of debris that are left or bigger bits, you, you make it easier to look at your McMaster slide when you're done. Uh, if you have large bits of debris uh, that you've transferred over to the McMaster slide, what you'll find is that it makes the slide very dark, and I find it slower and more tedious to read. So then you take your tongue, tongue blade and just kind of swish it around in there and get the remaining amount of fluid to go through. So now you've got your mixture and you're ready to fill your McMaster chambers. The critical thing here is that since this is a flotation procedure, uh, the eggs are going to start floating in your fluid as soon as, as it starts just sitting. The eggs are going to float up. And so it's really important, once you've mixed and strained, that you immediately fill the chambers of the McMaster slide. If the phone rings when you're at this point, you've done your, your uh, putting it through the uh, strainer, the phone rings, you go to answer the phone, you're gone for 10 minutes. When you come back, the flotation will have occurred in the cup. So what we'd like you to do, what you need to do, is fill the McMaster slide immediately after straining, uh, after straining the mixture. So we're, gonna, we're going to assume that I've done that. I'm going to kind of mix it up again a little bit here. The McMaster slide itself has two chambers. Each chamber has this grid that's uh, indicated by the green lines. You also see that there's a lip uh, in front of these chambers. And that lip is where you're going to place the tip of your pipette or eyedropper to fill the chambers. So what we do is we make sure our sample is really well mixed. We've sucked up the fluid of our well-mixed sample, and now we're going to put the tip of the pipette on the lip of the McMaster slide. I like to just tilt it away from me a little bit, put the tip on the, on the lip of the slide, and then just squirt. And it fills usually with no difficulty. Now there are a couple of tips to filling it. One is when you suck up the fluid, into, your, into whatever you're using, uh, uh, if you've got an eyedropper or a pipette like this, put a little pressure on the bulb so that the column of fluid is right at the tip when you start squirting it in. And that way you don't squirt in a big air bubble because air bubbles are our enemies here. If you get a big air bubble, uh, you'll have to suck the uh, material out and try again or rinse out the whole slide and try again. The other tip I would give you that I've, I've learned from uh, years of teaching students to do this technique, don't be tentative. Uh, everybody seems to be concerned that the fluid's going to squirt right out the other side. And in fact, that doesn't happen. You would have to squirt awfully hard to get the fluid to shoot out the other side. So don't be tentative. Don't squirt a little bit and stop, or, and then squirt a little bit more, because then you tend to get air bubbles in. So just gentle, firm pressure, and usually it fills without any difficulty at all. And as you practice this, you'll get very accomplished and have no difficulty filling the chambers. You want to fill the whole chamber, not just the area under the grid, but the whole chamber. So now we need to let this flotation occur inside the chamber. So Again, we let it sit. So now we're going to let this sit at least another five minutes uh, so that the eggs will float up in this fairly thick chamber and end up right underneath the top uh, piece of plastic that has the grid on it. Again, if the phone rings while well, you've done this, you've filled your slide and you go off to answer the phone and you talk for half an hour, it doesn't matter. This slide can sit as long as it sits at least five minutes it's not too critical how long it sits. I like to read them within an hour of setting them up because sometimes the fluid starts to evaporate. I just feel better setting myself that kind of limit and saying I'm going to read them within an hour. 
So now we're going to look at our slide. It's had a chance to sit for five minutes. We're going to come over to the microscope, turn the microscope light on, and pull back the clip that we have, push that slide all the way to the back of the uh, assembly that holds it so it's firmly in place. And then we're going to find the focus, our initial focus, with the 4X lens, the shortest lens. And that means it doesn't, you can't, you can't mess this up. That lens is so short, there is no way you're going to run it right down into the slide, so don't worry. So I'm going to adjust the eyepieces a little bit to suit me. And then I'm going to focus. And I'm going to focus so that the grid lines are in focus. And this will, not be, uh, this will not be at all difficult for you to recognize uh, where the grid lines are in focus. Then we go up to the 10x lens and use the fine focus. Then you want to, you're going to get ready to count. So what you have to do, we have this slide with two chambers. Um, you have to find a starting place. And a starting place is going to be a corner. So you want to find a slide corner uh, on the outside edge of one of the chambers. And usually with most microscopes, at the 10x lens, um, your, the width of one of the alleys, one of the, uh, the lines that you're going to read, usually fills the field. One of the lanes will usually feel the fill the field. Uh, you've still got your grid lines in focus. And I also find that I like to start in the same place every time so that I never forget where I am. Because we have to read both chambers, uh, you don't want to have to forget if you've already read the second one or if you're still on the first one. So I always start in exactly the same place so I know where I am. And then all you're going to do is use uh, your mechanical stage controls or if you don't have that, you have to use your fingers, and you're going to go up and down the lanes of the chamber and count the parasites that are there. Now, if, if you're going to see a lot of parasites, another piece of equipment that we didn't show you would be some way of tallying the number of parasites, and you can buy small clickers that you can use to keep track of the number of parasites. So then we just go up and down the lanes on one side, and then we pass over to the other side and do the same thing with the other chamber, adjusting the fine focus as necessary. When you have completed the egg counts on both chambers, you're going to add the uh, the number of eggs together. So if we saw three eggs on one side, two eggs on the other side, we would add those together to get a total of five uh, eggs. And then that number is multiplied by 50. So at that point, I know that I have 250 eggs per gram of manure. For those of you who want to know how that calculation is derived, how we get to that multiplication factor of 50, we have accompanying uh, information on the website that uh, lays that out for you, and you can go and, uh, and follow through uh, where that number 50 comes from. But the long and the short of it is, if you use 2 grams and 28 mLs of flotation solution, your multiplication factor is 50. You're counting each type of egg separately, uh, and then each type of egg, whether it's a whipworm egg, or a uh, strongylid egg, or a strongyloides egg, or a coccidia osis. Those would be counted separately, and then you multiply the final number from both sides by 50. Finally, when you're done with examining your slide, doing your fecal egg counts, uh, cleanup uh, is something to think about. By and large, the parasites we have in small ruminants 
really are very unlikely to infect people. And I don't think there's any particular concern about them at all. However, small ruminants like other farm animals could have bacterial organisms in their manure that uh, would be infectious for people. So we want to make sure that you clean up properly. Uh, ideally, you're going to put out a, a, a surface, a paper or plastic surface to do your fecals on so you can just pick it up and throw it away. Um, you want to make sure you thoroughly wash anything you're not throwing away. Uh, you want to use a probably a disinfectant solution on the surface uh, to wipe it down. Again, not, not so much because of the parasites, but because of other agents that might be in the fecal samples. Uh, I'm wearing gloves. We certainly recommend that you uh, wear the gloves to be handling feces. And that then will give you your fecal egg count on each sample and you repeat that for as many samples as you have. And really it should only take you a little bit of practice and you'll find that you develop uh, skill uh, doing these fecal egg counts very rapidly. Let me go through now some pointers on identifying uh, the different parasites that you're going to see in these fecal egg counts. Uh, firstly, how do you decide what's a parasite and what isn't? Because you're going to find quite quickly that there's an awful lot of plant material and pollen grains that look like they might be parasites. Uh, parasites in general are going to follow these rules. They're going to be round or oval in shape. And all parasites of the same species should be the same or similar in size. Uh, if it looks round or oval, but there's a huge variation in size, chances are it's not a parasite. Parasites generally have a very distinctive outer layer or shell and then also a distinctive inside, which is the cellular material that's the parasite embryo. Now, there's always uh, exceptions to, to every rule, so there, there are some exceptions to these as well. But in general, these points hold true. And another very important point, as you're evaluating the structures that you see in your fecal egg counts, is to keep relative sizes in mind. Um, Sometimes you might look at something and say, well, that looks to me like uh, a parasite egg, but it's so much smaller than any uh, similar egg I've ever seen. Uh, could it really be that parasite? And the answer usually is no. So once you've read slides and have a sense of what it is you're looking at, if you see something similar that's a way different size, it's probably not that parasite. So keeping the relative sizes in mind is important. Now the most common parasite egg, uh, worm egg, that you'll see in the feces of uh, small ruminants, both young animals and adults, is going to be what we call the strongylid egg, or the trichostrongyle egg, or the strongyle egg. People use different terms. They're all referring to the same thing, which is this group of worms that barber pole worm belongs to. These eggs are oval in size or oval in shape. Um, they have a thin shell surrounding the cellular material inside. And when they're passed fresh in manure, what you see on the inside is a ball of cells called blastomeres. And those cells are going to, in the environment, uh, multiply and ultimately form a larva. Now, in this photograph, you can see two uh, strongylid eggs and the blastomeres, that internal cellular structure, fills the entire egg. Sometimes when you're doing your fecal egg counts, you'll see, you'll see these eggs uh, where the cells only take up a portion of the interior and there may be some clear space uh, at one end or both ends, and it doesn't matter, they're still all the same thing. 
uh, these strongulate eggs. Also evident in this picture is an extremely common misleading uh, structure. You can see a number of circles in this view. They're different sizes. They have a very intense black outer rim, and those are air bubbles. And in every single uh, fecal procedure you do, you're going to see a bunch of these small air bubbles. So it's important to recognize that they are only air bubbles and not any kind of parasite um, that you need to be concerned about. And you can see in these uh, illustrations that uh, these eggs were taken from samples that had been sitting outside for a while and development has be begun. And you can see in the first one that there's a, a, a clump of cells that's starting to take on a worm shape in the egg. And in the second picture, you can see an egg where the larva has already formed. And if you look at it uh, under the microscope uh, in this uh, condition, it's probably going to be moving uh, inside the egg as it's getting ready to hatch. Now we can only identify these parasites to a group because they're so similar in appearance and even the sizes overlap. Sometimes when you look at them you can see there's a bigger one and a smaller one but their sizes overlap so much it's really impractical to try and determine uh, which particular species is present. Now usually there's no need to know which particular species is present because there is a strong seasonality to the distribution of the worms and, where, and we said that where homonchus predominates in the, in the grazing season, in, in homonchus transmission season, this worm is so prolific that we know that most of the eggs in the fecal sample come from homonchus. We can be pretty confident that most of the eggs are coming from homonchus. Of course, clinical disease information is also helpful as well. The other reason why we don't worry too much about identifying these worms specifically is that the type of integrated parasite control programs that you should be using for your animals will really address all that group of parasites. You don't need a specific program just for one type and a specific program for another. If you're evaluating animals, knowing that homonchus is more uh, important and, and you're making treatment decisions uh, through FAMACHA uh, using fecal egg counts as well, you're also going to pick up those other related worms too. There is a laboratory procedure that is available in some laboratories that does allow you to specifically identify the percentage of homonchus eggs in the sample. There's also a, a procedure whereby you can culture the worms in the sample and then identify the larvae that are formed. But for most people, these procedures aren't necessary and they wouldn't be something that you would do uh, uh, on your own farm. They're more uh, diagnostic laboratory procedures. Now, because there's always an exception to every rule, there is one member of this strongylid um, group or trichostrongyle group that we see in the eastern U.S. that is distinctive and can be identified specifically and that's a worm called nematodirus that makes absolutely enormous eggs. And you can see in the, in the picture here that the nematodirus eggs, egg is at least twice the size in length of our typical uh, strongulate eggs. So this is one that you can actually tell apart. This is a parasite that in some parts of the world is quite important. In the eastern U.S. Uh, it is not a particularly important, important parasite, but these eggs are dramatic and, and always exciting to see when they're there. Another worm that you might see in your fecal samples, particularly in young animals, it's, it's Unusual to see it in the feces of adult animals. They develop a strong enough immunity that you don't usually see these worms, but in young animals, this is a very common parasite. It's called strongyloides or threadworm. 
And unfortunately, its name sounds very much like strongyles and trichostrongyles, but it's a completely different parasite. It too has a thin shell, and you might be tempted to confuse it with uh, strongyle parasites, but it's much smaller. And not only is it smaller, but when those eggs are passed in the feces, when strongyloides eggs come out in the feces, they contain an actual larva. And remember that our strongylid eggs, like barber pole worm, those eggs in fresh feces only contain a clump of cells. So we've got a photograph here where you can see both our standard strongylid eggs and then also the strongyloides eggs. And you can really appreciate how much smaller it is than our, uh, our regular strongylid or strongyle, trichostrongyle eggs. This parasite very infrequently causes disease. It's usually just something that's there, uh, but because you're floating up all the eggs that are present in the animal's manure, you're floating up these eggs as well. Another structure that you're going to see uh, commonly in sheep and goat manure, you'll see it in manure of animals of all ages, but again, especially in young animals, that will be coccidia. And coccidia oocysts uh, can be present in large numbers of animals. Uh, sheep and goats are uh, each infected with a large number of species. So you'll see when you look at fecal samples of young animals containing coccidia, you may see several different types, and that's because there are different species in them. These organisms are also oval uh, to round in shape, in the, uh, and and when they're passed in the manure, there's just a single cell on the inside. And you can see in the photographs we have here that coccidia oocysts are much smaller than the worm eggs. Uh, coccidia are single-celled organisms, and we're, so we're dealing with something that in size is at most half the size of our strongyle type eggs, our barber pole worm eggs. Some of them have a little cap, some of them don't. Um, but here the numbers are very difficult to interpret again. Sometimes you'll see them in enormous numbers and think, well, this must be really significant. When you look at the animal, the animal's perfectly normal. So you need to be conservative, uh, certainly, in your interpretation of numbers of coccidia organisms. But they're very, very common in feces, uh, a common finding. Another thing that you'll see pretty commonly, and especially in young animals, are tapeworm eggs. Tapeworm eggs break the rule of this round to oval shape that we see with tapeworms, because tapeworm eggs tend to be triangular or almost square in shape. And they're about the same size as our standard uh, strongyle type eggs. Um, What's unique about them is that in the egg itself, there's a small circle that is the little tapeworm embryo. And inside that embryo, you can actually see little hooks. Now, on a McMaster test, you probably won't be able to appreciate that level of detail because the McMaster slides are so thick that you can't focus far enough down with the high power to see those hooks. But you're basically looking at all these square to triangular shaped things. Now, there's absolutely no point in counting these eggs. And the reason is that tapeworm eggs come out of the host animal in segments. The segments from the tapeworm are shed containing thousands of eggs. If your sample of feces that you're using contains a segment and you mix that up and look at the fecal egg count, you may have thousands of tapeworm eggs present in the fecal sample you're evaluating. If the little bit of feces you're using doesn't contain a segment, you won't see any tapeworm eggs. Tapeworms really don't cause much disease in small ruminants. We, we are not particularly concerned about the presence or absence of tapeworm eggs, but you may see them as you're doing your fecal egg counts. The other common worm in the manure of small ruminants is the whipworm egg, Trichurus. And this is a very distinctive and easily recognized egg. It's football-shaped. 
It's brown. It has a plug at each end. It's about the same size as our strongyle type eggs, and it's just there. It's usually, usually you'll see a few only, and again, in the feces of young animals especially, and again, it's a parasite that really doesn't cause very much disease. Uh, and unless there were extraordinary numbers, uh, you'd be unlikely to be concerned uh, about seeing them, but you will see them. There are lots of non-parasites. Uh, I'm giving you just a few examples here. Uh, in the first picture, you see a very common non-parasite in fecal samples, um, and that's pine pollen very common pseudoparasite that we see uh, at, at some times of the year. Other structures, plant material may be round. You may want to call it an egg, but it's not. So in summary, as you're reading um, your fecal samples, determining your fecal egg counts, be consistent in your technique um, use it, use fecal egg counts to uh, evaluate drug efficacy, use them to help you identify uh, animals' uh, individual susceptibility to parasites, and uh, use them in evaluating your integrated uh, parasite control programs. Thank you for watching this video. My colleague, Dr. Katherine Peterson, and I hope that you find the information useful. If you would like additional information on this topic, it can be found on URI's Small Ruminant Parasite Control website.